Welcome to this edition of Identity Blocks Blockchain Trends. Good morning, everyone. Morning. No le digo más. Está, so esta sí, esta chino va en, eh, va en inglés, pero si quieres, si, si quieren y se motivan, yo puedo abrir el chat, o hablo con Rolo y hablamos allí un rato, aunque no lo grabemos en YouTube o si lo quieren grabar lo grabamos. Saber algunas palabras, yeah. It helps, it helps sometimes to know a few words. So yeah, guys, we're going to talk a little bit about stable coins today and uh, just making sure that we're up to date of what is it that they, uh, the planners are thinking for us, right? Yo, what's up? I messaged Bully, but... Uh, he was busy, so maybe, uh, maybe next week. Can you use Google Translation also? It helps. It really helps. Gracias. Ojalá puedas por lo menos una vez a la semana en español. Son muy interesantes tus puntos de vista. Se, se agradece la información. Claro que sí, Chi. Es mi placer. Para eso estamos. Lo hacemos, lo hacemos. Let me see if I can. All right, I think that might work a little better. Alrighty, so basically today what I'm going to do is, this is um, pretty much a recap of a video that we had done maybe six months ago, so let's go ahead and check the, the video so that you guys can check it out if you want to see what we were talking about a couple months ago. Um, I did a second one that was pretty close. find it there we go this one I called it the circle deployed the CBDC for the United States back in 2020 okay I'm gonna share it with you guys and this was I said it was a few months ago but it was actually on May 8th of 2022, so it's 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 been a minute. They got Joe over there. We had some other guys. So, so yeah, go go check that one, and then this is going to be almost like a recap of what we were talking back then, because I want you guys to see what the changes have been that made me think this way okay and then the other thing that i wanted to cover it looks like there's been some like false rumors being spread about gensler getting uh getting the boot or resigning so uh, i haven't seen anything official uh the article that i saw was from some random site that you could tell that they it's not like a you know, it's like an opinion piece site. So anyone can just write in one of these. I used to have a one of these for crypto taxes. I used to write my own articles. 
Um, so let's see uh, this one here. Crypto alert. So it's called crypto alert, right? So it's it's not like coming from like. from a trusted source so but still let's just let's read it and enter entertain ourselves on stuff. <laughs> All right. All right, so it says the sec sources confirm that gary gensler the gary gensler's uh, resignation so let's see if uh, if that's the case And it says, in a stunning revelation, an anonymous official from the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, has reportedly disclosed that Gary Gensler, the chairman of the SEC, had submitted his resignation following an internal investigation. This bombshell news has sent shockwaves through the financial industry, raising concerns about the integrity of the regulatory body and the implications for investors, investor confidence. The anonymous SEC official who spoke on the condition of anonymity due to the sensitive nature of the matter, stated Gary Gensler has resigned from his position as chairman of the SEC following an internal investigation into alleged misconduct. The details of the investigations are confidential, but the decision to step down underscores the seriousness of the findings. Um, Gary Gensler took the helm of the SEC in April of 2021, bowing to strengthen the market oversight and protect investors. His tenure was uh, marked by a robust approach to regulation, particularly in the areas of cryptocurrency and digital assets. So, Gensler's background in finance and his reputation for enforcing stringent regulations earn him respect among some industry experts. However, the recent anonymous revelation has thrown a shadow of doubt over Gensler's leadership. The news of an internal investigation raises questions about potential improperties and whether his actions were in line with the standard expected from the head of a regulatory body. One anonymous industry insider commented, the resignation of Gary Gensler in the, in the wake of an internal investigation is deeply concerning. It calls into questions the integrity and effectiveness of the SEC under his leadership. The financial industry relies on the SEC to ensure fair and transparent markets and um, any allegations of misconduct at the top uh, level erode investor trust. Another anonymous source familiar with the matter emphasized the importance of accountability in regulatory agencies. So. The SEC has a crucial role in maintaining the integrity of the financial markets when the head of the of um, the head of such an institution faces allegations serious enough to prompt resignation. It raises significant concerns about the regulatory framework and the enforcement of rules. The SEC must address these issues swiftly and transparently to restore confidence. The exact nature of the alleged misconduct or the details of the internal investigation remain undisclosed. They're great. So this is coming from an anonymous source and it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they don't talk about the the investigation or wow okay so leaving the room for speculation and uncertainty until an official statement is released by the sec or gary gensler himself the public and the financial industry can only speculate on the reasons behind his resignation as news of gensler departure spread the sec now faces the daunting task of restoring faith in its operations and finding a suitable replacement to lead the regulatory body. The next chairman will inherit a challenging environment requiring a delicate balance between regulatory enforcement, investor protection, and uh, fostering innovation. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, Hester Pierce ends up, I mean, like I said, if this is real and then she takes over, that would be nice. In conclusion, the reported resignation of Gary Gensler as chairman of the SEC following an internal investigation has sent shockwaves to the financial industry. The lack of transparency surrounding the allegations. This is basically the same kind of repeated. So, th it, I mean, it, it seems fake. I'm sorry, guys. Like, it seems like someone that just kind of wanted to get some coin pumped or something for the weekend or something like that. I'm not sure. Grab, 
Great, great to all. Que dicen los OG. Todo bien. Everything good, brother. Everything good. Things have calmed down from yesterday's. My yesterday uh, clickbaity post. Hot of says <laughs> I need proof of life. I uh, go go check my tweet like what I posted today. You guys are gonna laugh here. Boxer, scammer, sponsy scheme, SEC pump of mentals. I know, right? Like, I mean, we're we're on it. I think that if this is the case, uh, draft LOL. Um, but it, I mean, Marco, really, here's the thing: like, the only site that I I even saw talking about this, but you know, to today. It's this thing you today. So I don't think this is like a real site, right? Like a, like a new site or so. But and then it talks about XRP community ablaze with fake rumors of Gensler's possible resignation. Um, XRP community is awash with blatantly fake rumors of the impending resignation of the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC Chair Gary Gensler. Uh, prominent XRP accounts like Document and Ripple have been instrumental in circulating their unconfirmed news. And then this is the article that I just read to you guys. It's just, it's Gensler assumed the role of the SEC chair, blah, blah, blah. We read all that. Despite the swirling rumors, Gensler's resignation seems highly unlikely. His tenure so far has been marked by a dis distinct push for robust crypto regulations and bringing more transparency to the market, a task that is far from complete. Uh, per historical pro uh, precedents, no SEC chair has resigned within the first two years of their tenure, uh, making Gensler's supposed departure even more dubious. Adding to the counter-narrative, some prominent XRP community members have started challenging these unverified claims. Uh, Well-known figure in XRP community warned followers of fake news websites spreading the uncorroborated Gensler resignation story. Uh, Crypto Erie, another prominent member, also advised the community to be responsible users of social media. And not follow, share, spread anything without verifying. So, just just saying, guys. I I don't think. I mean, I think that by now it would have been picked up. The only thing that I'm I'm seeing that seems legit is them telling them he needs to recuse himself. But that's that's a whole different thing, right? That's not a resignation. Um, so this is from Fortune Crypto, and this is from a couple of days ago. This would have been from the 29th. And it says, the SEC Chair Gensler must recuse himself from crypto enforcement decisions. Um, Securities and Exchange Commission SEC Chair Gary Gensler is in the midst of a relentless crusade against the American digital asset industry. Despite the industry, industry's repeated calls for the SEC to issue clarifying rulemaking and guidance and guidance. The law governing digital asset remain unacceptably opaque. The SEC's recent strikes against uh, leading companies such as, Coin such as Coinbase make it clearer than ever that Chair Gensler Gensler's goal is to make crypto illegal in America. With such clear bias and such dereliction of the basic tenets of due process, the agency cannot fairly supervise the digital asset industry. This is why it's time for Chair Gensler to recuse himself from any further decisions related to SEC enforcement of the American digital asset industry. The SEC mission is to protect investors while maintaining fair and orderly market and to facilitate capital formation. To carry out its mission, some of the SEC divisions devise rule, rules and guidance under the rulemaking authority granted to the agency by Congress. By Congress. 
When it comes to digital assets, the SEC has abandoned its role as, as a rulemaking body, giving investors and company founders no clear way to answer the fundamental question of how or whether securities law applies apply to their products or services. This lack of rulemaking action doesn't mean the SEC has been idle. On the contrary, on the contrary, in lieu of thoughtful rules that take into account the unique nature of digital assets, the SEC has gone into enforcement overdrive, targeting the crypto industry with wave after wave of punitive enforcement actions. Unlike other federal agencies, before filing an enforcement action, the SEC follows a process known as the Wells process, which allows entities alleged to have violated the law a, chan a chance to respond and be heard. In other words, providing targets of enforcement actions with due process. At the beginning of this process, the target under the investigation receives a Wells notice that states the alleged violation and provides the target with an opportunity to present evidence in their defense to the SEC Enforcement Division. If the agency wishes to pursue the case at the conclusion of this process, they present the facts to the commissioners who then vote on whether to proceed. The commissioners must comply with the principles of due process in their decision to file an enforcement action, which requires them, them to act without bias and even avoid to appearance of bias only after reviewing both sides of the case without having prejudged any fact or any issue. The commissioners vote whether or not to file action so yeah let's just get away from this because like i said it just it seems that it's like a fake it's like a fake article guys okay? so it just I, I don't know banks are great more than 1.5 truly commercial real estate mortgages will have to be renegotiated before 2025 um yeah it, it looks really bad especially in some places like california new york Illinois, LOL milk cartons, right? Yeah. Yeah, be careful with all that stuff. So guys, at what point uh, I think that this whole process with the the CBDC started in the U.S. and that was in March of 2020. Uh, very, very low times for uh, for Bitcoin. It was under under four thousand dollars at some of the days. And then this is what I noticed. So I was doing videos in in my channel at that point, but I was doing those videos in Spanish. So the ones that I have, I guess that we can discuss them, but then, uh, like I said, they're in Spanish, so we can, I'm going to see if I can like replay them or something, or maybe dub them in English or we'll see what I do. But then, uh, if you guys, we're going to go by the dates, right? So this one would have been March 11th of 2020. Okay. And this is when the, the, the banks went to the white house. The economy, we're discussing how it relates to jobs and all of the things that are happening right now with the with the virus that we've become so familiar with. I'll be making some decisions. I've already made some decisions actually today, but I'll be making some uh, some other ones that are very important. Uh, and I thought I'd let the press in to hear some of the wisdom from the folks in the room. And maybe, Brian, I'll start with you. And Brian's the... Uh, chairman and he's uh, the man at the at uh, bank of america uh, highly respected everybody in this room is at the highest level highly respected uh, brian please thank you mr president thank you for bringing us together um the, the ceos of the, of the large banks here uh want you to know that we're because of all the work done on a the capital liquidity and all the things as we look forward to uncertainty due to the virus and oil uh, price uh, changes we're very strong and capitalized. We are in great position in terms of liquidity, capital, and strength. But most importantly, we're doing what we do best, which is helping our, our teammates, uh, importantly, but also our, our clients and our small business customers, our medium-sized business customers, continue to have access to credit. All of us are providing relief to any customer that has an issue of being out of work for the virus. We're, the things we've done in every natural disaster that's occurred in many years. Um, and 
so let's leave it at that because it's like a five six minute uh, conversation. Basically, the bankers just saying we have money, we are liquid, but the situation is obviously they're not talking about the repo markets back of September 2019. So around six months or earlier, they were already getting trillions of dollars through the repo market and reverse repo and that whole other mess, right? Like it repo market went almost to like 10%. So we're like swapping billions of dollars per night. So why is it that I want to cover this? And it's because I see this article or actually let's just go the days by days. And then after we'll go through the article. So then that meeting we talked and it was March the 11th, right? Well, just five days later. So something happened in that meeting where five days later, they decide that Brian Brooks is going to be named OCC chief, right? And then it's going to start effective April the 1st of 2020. So let's go ahead and see the dates and see why is it that I'm that I'm talking about this? Because as I mentioned here, it says um, the designation at first deputy controller is made by Secretary of the Treasury, Stephen T. Mnuchin. With, right. We know that they work together in Wall Street. So it's it's good. They just they got their, their buddies in. So it mentions Brian Brooks is a strong leader with extensive experience in the financial services sector, said Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. I look forward to working with him to ensure the stability of our financial system and its ability to foster greater economic growth for the benefit of all Americans. Okay. So, and we know that uh, he was in charge of, uh, of Circle and uh, all that good stuff. Let's, let's Wikipedia him real quick. So this is where they work together with Mnuchin on one West Bank, right? After working at Fannie Mae, Brooks was chief legal officer at Coinbase from 2018 to 2020. Coinbase is an 8 billion Silicon Valley startup that is one of the largest digital currency platforms in the world. At Coinbase, he was responsible for the company's legal, compliance, internal audit, government relations, and global intelligence group. Okay. So, you know, that means working with, with USDC and Circle. Okay, and then we continue the dates, right? He started April 1st, right? So he was appointed March 16th, but then on March 15th, there was already announcements happening, right? So it mentions, as announced on March 15th, 2020, the board reduced reserve requirement ratio 0% effective March 26, 2020. This action eliminated reserve requirements for all depository institutions. So in my opinion, I think this was the swap. The banks got this. Mnuchin and Trump got Brian Brooks into OCC. That was like the, 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 that was like the trade. <laughs> Imagine if it's like a, a couple of weeks from now, it's like we're in the trade deadline of the baseball season, right? And it mentions the following content explains the board's authority to impose reserve requirements and how reserve requirements were administered prior to the change in reserve requirement ratios to zero. Additional detail of this reserve requirement regime can be found in the Archive Reserve Maintenance Manual. The Federal Reserve Act authorizes the board to establish reserve requirements within specified ranges for purposes of implementing monetary policy on certain types of deposits and other liabilities of depository institutions. The dollar amount of a depository institution's reserve requirement is determined by applying the reserve requirement ratio specified by the board's Regulation D, which we've talked about Regulation D, right? 
To uninstitution reservable liabilities, the Federal Reserve Act authorizes the board to impose reserve requirements on transactions to count non-personal time deposits and euro currency liabilities we talked about the other day, the euro dollar, right? Prior to the change effective March 26, 2020, reserve requirement ratios on net transactions accounts deferred based on the amount of net transactions accounts at the depository institution. A certain amount of net transaction accounts known as the zero, uh, known as the reserve requirement exemption amount was subject to a reserve requirement ratio of 0%. So no more reserve, uh, fractionary reserve, right? And now is a complete new ball game. That's why I said that March 26, that was the actual real run on the banks because that that's the day, guys. That's the day that they they took your purchasing power and you didn't do anything. Net transaction account balances above the low reserve tranche were subject to a reserve requirement ratio 10%. The reserve requirement exemption amount of the low reserve tranche are indexed each year pursuant to formula specified in the Federal Reserve. So now the new formula has a zero in it. Okay. So that was the thing. It's just if you imagine like the Federal Reserve Act or when they took the gold or when Nixon took gold convertibility in 71, that was the day. That was March 26, 2020. Not that many people caught it. Like some of us caught it. Like I, I did a video in Spanish on that same day, but. And then if we're continuing the dates, um, check this date then on July 22nd. Uh, this one already comes then from the OCC, right? So Brian Brooks at this point, he would have been since April the 1st. So April, May, June, July, basically three and a half months in. And you figure like, what would you be doing when you're like three and a half months in as a government bureaucrat like are you seriously going to make this kind of move unless it was already planned or negotiated in that meeting in march and then it says federally chartered banks and thrifts may provide custody services for crypto assets and remember that at this point they already had three months of zero reserve requirements the office of the controller of the currency occ Today published a letter clarifying national banks and federal savings associations authority to provide cryptocurrency custody services for customers. National and state banks and thrifts have long provided safekeeping and custody services, including both physical objects and electronic assets. The OCC has specifically recognized the importance uh, of digital assets and the authority for banks to provide safekeeping for such assets since 1998 in the letter published today uh, the OCC concludes that providing cryptocurrency custody services including holding unique cryptographic keys associated with cryptocurrency so of course here we're telling you do not do this do not give your keys to your bank is a modern form of uh, traditional bank activities related to custody services Crypto custody services may extend beyond passively holding keys. From safe deposit boxes to virtual vaults, we must ensure banks can meet the financial services needs of their customers today, said acting controller of the currency, Brian P. Brooks. This option clarifies that banks can continue satisfying their customers' need for safeguarding their most valuable assets, which today for tens of millions of Americans includes cryptocurrency. The OCC also recognized that at, at, as the financial markets are increasingly digitized, the need will increase for banks and other services providers to leverage new technology and innovative ways, ways to serve their customers' needs. By doing so, banks can continue to fulfill the financial intermediation function they have historically played in providing payment, lending, and deposit services. Today's opinion applies to national banks and federal savings associations of all sizes. And is consistent with a number of states which have already authorized state banks or trust companies to provide similar functions. Okay, so this was in July. In July, at that point, in my opinion, this is where they sealed the CBDC being released by the commercial banks because at that point you're seeing that the banks are zero reserve requirements so they can play with as much as they want but 
they're also having access to load up with stable coins or load up with any type of crypto at this point, right? So we're seeing that some of the banks, they didn't survive after just three years, which the case of Silicon Valley Bank. And, and of course, it was because of other things. They were like long <laughs> like deposits at like 2% and that type of dumb stuff. So I know that is. But then let's go ahead and read this six months later. Brooks steps down. So he gets, gets in April 1st. His biggest move comes in July. Allows the banks to have access to crypto custody now, in this case, for three years, right? In the next two weeks. And then um, he just steps down and then takes a job at Beat Fury and then later at Binance US, right? So it mentions uh, acting controller of the currency Brian P. Brooks today announced he will step down on January 14th, 2021, and pursuant to blah, 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 Chief Operating Officer Blake Paulson will become acting controller of the currency. It has been a great honor to serve the United States as acting controller of the currency. Acting Controller Brooks said the Office of the Controller of the Currency OCC is the most extraordinary, 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 extraordinary of federal agencies filled with the most dedicated professional and gifted staff any executive can hope to have. I am extremely proud of what we have accomplished together through what we have been extraordinary. Oh my God, I can't say that word. Extraordinary times by let's see, by any measure during his eight months as acting controller the OCC acted swiftly to provide relief and support to national banks and federal savings associations so they could use their strength to help consumers business and communities through COVID-19 pandemic has promoted greater financial access and economic opportunity by eliminating regulatory uncertainty regarding valid when made and true lender rules this was another thing that they did too, right? So the agency also continued to implement its new Community Reinvestment Act rules to promote more investment, lending, and services where they're needed most. In addition, the agency enhanced the relevance and value of the federal charter and help ensure the federal banking system can evolve to meet, can evolve to meet the changing demands of consumers, meaning crypto, and markets by clarifying bank and thrift authorities regarding certain activities related to crypto assets and continuing to defend our authority to charter companies engaged in the business of banking with business models that focus on serving customers in new and specific ways. By the way, guys, this, this has already been kind of stopped because I want to say in the last like six months, FDIC and the Fed and the new guy from OCC, which is not him or Paulson, um, already sent messages to all the banks saying, please be careful with crypto. And that was like a couple days before Silicon Valley Bank went. So the actions we took as a team will help ensure the federal banking system operates in a safer, sounder and fairer manner to, uh, for decades to come. Chief among the initiatives launched during Acting Controller Brooks' tenure is Project Reach. Includes active participation of bankers, civil, civil rights leaders, and technologists working at national and, re and regional levels to identify and reduce barriers to prevent underserved and minority populations from participating fully and fairly in our economy. The movement demonstrates the good the agency can do by, by con convening hearts and minds and aligning them to a common cause, blah, 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 blah. So, and then the guy that replaced him was Mr. Paulson as a career bank examiner and has served as chief operating officer since June, 2020 in his role. Mr. Paulson oversaw OCC bank supervision and OCC management operations, as well as staff responsible for systemic risk identification, support, and specialty supervision and supervision system and, and analytical support. 
Prior to his role, Mr. Paulson was responsible for supervising nearly 1,100 national banks and federal savings associations, as well as nearly 1,600 OCC employees as senior deputy controller. So... So yeah, he was there for eight months. But at that point, like I said, basically they had already got all that stuff in, right? Banks at zero reserve requirements. Banks get to uh, do crypto custody. And uh, I mean, none of this went through Congress, by the way, guys. I, f I forgot to tell you. <laughs> This was all like very like hush hush boom boom. And then why are we talking about this? Is because a couple of days ago, this is where Coinbase is going now. It mentions modernizing and securing direct deposit systems with blockchain-based stablecoin settlements. And I think I've talked to you guys so much about this. But let's go one more time. Uh, Coinbase is working to update the financial system by building trusted products that expand the utility and adoption of crypto. Crypto is the update to the older and slower automated clearinghouse direct deposit, more commonly known as ACH, with settlement via stablecoin cryptocurrencies. With settlement via stablecoin cryptocurrencies. Crypto can address several shortcomings of the ACH direct deposit system while providing additional consumer protections. And I think I talked about this like maybe like a week ago when we talked about Fed now, right? But they're not going to remove ACH or RTP, which is called a real-time payments network, or the FET wire or cash. They're not going to remove any of those for the next two to five years. They just they want to make sure that this just integrates without hiccups. At Coinbase, we're working hard to help update the financial system by building trusted products that expand the utility and adoption of crypto. Because we believe crypto and blockchain technology have the ability to increase economic freedom and opportunity around the world. Coinbase chose to become a public company in the U.S. because we believe the U.S. would be best served by embracing this fundamental innovation. But we're also focused on international markets, many of which are moving forward with strategies to become crypto hubs. Um, a key part of fulfilling this commitment is building technologies that help update the financial system in a manner that prioritizes consumer rights and security. One way we're doing this is by improving the way that millions of Americans receive their compensation today by providing an alternative to ACH. Uh, with settlement via stablecoin cryptocurrencies, there are several shortcomings of the ACH direct deposit system. And of course, I can tell you which those are, right? They wouldn't be open today. They wouldn't be open tomorrow because um, most of the, uh, them would be closed for 4th of July, right? So that type of situation. So if you do... If you go through the Fed or SWIFT... Um, there are several shortcomings of the ACH direct deposit system and blockchain based stablecoin settlement can address these issues, right? They could transfer 24, seven, 365. It would be cheaper transactions. They would probably start closing branches. So that's going to be like the new banking system for them. That's why they like it so much because they can do more service for cheaper with less people. But don't tell them I told you. The ACH network was established in the 1970s to replace paper checks with a secure, efficient, and cost-effective money transfer system in the United States. Today, the ACH direct deposit process involves several steps. Initiation, where employers provide relevant information following National Automated Clearinghouse Association guidelines. 
transmission as employers send the ACH file to their bank known as Originating Deposit Financial Institution or ODFI and schedule batches causing delays. <laughs> um, so anyone that has mastered all those key keys, <laughs> clearing where the ACH operator sorts and transfer transactions to receiving depository financial institutions and where RDFIs decode the information and deposit funds into employees' accounts subject to potential delays based on the RDFI policies. Consider considering the stages and timing involved, the total ACH process from initiation to fund availability can take one to two business days. Weekends, bank holidays, and additional processing time required by the employer's payroll system can extend this timeline further. Uh, shortcomings of the ACH direct deposit system. Oh, it talks about this too. There are several shortcomings in the ACH direct deposit system that hinder efficiency and consumer protection. Multiple actors, the involvement of multiple parties such as the employer, ODFI, ACH operator, employee, and RDFI adds complexity and increases the time required for fund transfers. And of course, it increases their cost of service, right? Because right there, they would cut one, two, three positions. Any failure or exemption handling at any step can lead to additional delays. Uh, lack of standard standardization. Standardization. Um, the mechanism for transmitting ACH files between the ODFI and the ACH operator is not standardized. Each ODFI must integrate with the ACH operator individually, leading to complexity and potential delays. Additionally, access to the rules and guidelines of the ACH network requires a payment to an ACHA. So the ACH direct deposit system overall, so you see what I mean? It is about saving a couple of pennies, you see? So it's about cutting these guys over here saving a couple pennies over here and then just what i said a slow process because especially like imagine imagine that their financial institution doesn't work on monday and tuesday because tuesday is the fourth so basically if you were to have done a direct no, not a direct deposit but like a, a, a fed wire on like saturday at like 1 p.m Actually, the bank probably closed at noon. So even if you did any any time, any time that you did a, a wire on 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 Saturday, like if you did a wire late, like maybe like three p.m. on Friday, that thing is going to be stuck there till Wednesday <laughs> Wednesday morning, man. And it doesn't matter. Like you probably pay like fifty bucks or something for that wire, maybe thirty-two bucks, thirty-five. There are all kinds of you know prices depending on your financial institution. Um. And it mentions that the ACH direct deposit system overall speed is a significant concern. If a direct deposit is initiated at 445, well, that's basically what I just said. Actually, they're saying this is standard, but not really. Like if you do it like on Friday, oh, well, actually, yeah, they, they say it the long weekend. So that's what we just said. So basically, that's the three things. They fire these guys over here. They avoid paying the National um, Automated Clearinghouse Agency. And uh, what's this one? Oh, and then like they, they're working like Saturday, Sundays and all that stuff. Right. So, for example, like, if you were to go on the on a bank like on a Saturday and you are able to maybe work through like the, you know how now they have those like uh, smart ATMs. So now you just go to the ATM and then you just kind of work like it's. There's a teller. And here's how they get us, guys, with the sweet talk. Benefits of blockchain-based stablecoin settlement. A blockchain-based stablecoin settlement offers a potential solution to the inefficiencies and consumer protection concerns of the ACH direct deposit system. Let's explore the benefits. Delivery times, confirmation times for stablecoin transactions can range from a matter of minutes to a few minutes on layer two Ethereum based networks like Base, Optimism, blah, 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 blah. This is in stark contrast to the one, two business days required for ACH direct deposits. 
There's cost saving. The economic efficiency resulting from the slowness of ACH direct deposits can be estimated by calculating the difference in settlement times and multiplying it by the total transaction volume using the federal funds rate of 5%. And assuming an average direct deposit takes one business day, the estimated annual economic inefficiency amounts to a whopping $2.67 billion. Minimization of price volatility. And of course, they're just talking about this. They're not talking about the people that they're going to fire and then they're going to save on their, right? But they're not going to tell you that one. Minimization of price volatility. Stable coins are cryptocurrencies pegged to a reserve of assets, minimizing price volatility. For example, USDC. For example... USDC, a stablecoin pegged to the US dollar blockchain, is a decentralized digital ledger that records transactions within a network. Consensus mechanisms like proof of work and proof of stake and proof of tweet enable agreement on the ledger state, minimizing overall price volatility. Elimination of middlemen. Blockchain-based stablecoin transactions remove middlemen like ODFIs and RDFIs. You see what I mean? No middlemen. So they get to save. And to us, they're like selling us our little blockchain buzzwords. Users have direct control over their assets and digital wallets, avoiding potential failures and delays. Atomic nature of stablecoin transactions. Uh, Stablecoin transactions are atomic, meaning they're all or nothing. Once confirmed by the consensus mechanism, transactions are irreversible and recorded on the blockchain. So open source blockchains offer transparency, trust, and easy composability. Developers can review, modify, and integrate with existing blockchain infrastructure, fostering innovation and efficiency. Contrary to popular belief, blockchain-based stablecoin settlements offer similar security guarantees of ACH transactions without compromising settlement time while blockchains are inherently secure due to decentralization and cryptographic algorithms. Additional measures have been developed to safeguard users and their assets. You have MPC, a multi-party computation-based crypto wallets. Uh, crypto wallets distribute crypto assets control among multiple parties, even if one party is compromised. The assets remain secure as others can block unauthorized transactions. We have multi-sigs, multi-signature smart contract wallet functions, similarly requiring approval from multiple parties for transactions completion, mimicking the dual control system and traditional banking. Escrowing smart contracts can also hold assets until specific conditions are met, preventing fraud and contract breaches. And then custodial wallets provide added protection by entrusting a trusted third party with the user's assets. While this reintroduces an intermediary, it's important to note that such services are optional in the blockchain ecosystem and are chosen for convenience or extra security. The promise of increased security of blockchain-based settlement system is further bolstered by ongoing legis legislative efforts. Currently, the United States House of Financial Services Committee is considering legislation that provides comprehensive guidelines for stablecoin markets. And this is the one that I talked to you about yesterday, right, guys? The one from Maxine Waters and McHenry. So we're going to we're going to review that one after this. The clarity and regulatory framework provided by such legislation, if enacted, would enhance. You think they're going to enact it? What do you guys think? You want to bet? <laughs> you want to bet it's already been enacted and they just need to play their little circus uh, the clarity and regulatory framework provided by such legislation if enacted would enhance the trustworthiness of blockchain based stablecoin settlement systems such as circle such formalized oversight could help ensure the responsible issuance and management of stablecoin enhancing their sustainability suitability um, as a viable option for efficient, secure financial transactions. 
This is like their pitch, you know. They're trying to take over. By offering blockchain-based stablecoin settlements as an alternative to the ACH direct deposit system, Coinbase addresses the inefficiencies and consumer protections issues inherent in traditional methods. The ACH direct deposit system suffers from complexity, lack of standardization, and slow processing times, while blockchain-based stablecoin settlements provide faster confirmation times, significant cost savings, and minimize price volatility. Additionally, the elimination of middlemen, atomic transactions, and open source nature of blockchain technology contribute to enhanced security and efficiency, ongoing legislative efforts to establish comprehensive guidelines for stablecoin markets further reinforce the trustworthiness of blockchain-based settlements. Coinbase, Coinbase believes that by prior, prioritizing consumer rights and security, we can foster a future where financial transactions are not only efficient, but also empower individuals and business with economic freedom and opportunity on a global scale. So yeah, guys. Let's check the, uh, the other article real quick. And this one's from June 9th. And it says the U.S. House Committee releases new stablecoin bill draft. A draft bill is set to go before the House Committee for discussion on June 13th. And if approved, could become the first example of crypto legislation in the United States. The United States House Financial Services Committee has released the third draft of the stablecoin bill presented by its chair, Representative Patrick McHenry. The latest draft of the bill bipartisan and includes specific proposals from Republican and Democratic committee members. The draft bill titled The Future of Digital Assets, providing clarity for the digital asset ecosystem, was first proposed on June 8th and is expected to be discussed during the upcoming committee hearing on June 13th. The bill's latest version proposed the U.S. Federal Reserve as the key regulator task with formulating requirements for issuing stablecoins. However, at the same time, the bill aims to offer state regulators powers to oversee the companies issuing the tokens. So at the same time that they're voting for the Fed not to release a CBDC, they're also saying that they're going to be their key regulator. You see how stupid that sounds? You see why I used to say that that it was just a dumb bill, what they were saying? It was just basically a bill to guarantee that the that the banks were going to have access to tons of money for years. Uh, the bill further discusses legislation regarding who can issue stable coins, which we know it's going to be the GSIBs, right? So it's going to be like only eight or maybe 12 people that, uh, 10 or 12 banks that, that can do this. So maybe like Coinbase, maybe NASDAQ, and then obviously the top eight banks or the GSIPs. Um, the bill further discusses legislation regarding who can issue stablecoins and the requirements of a payment stablecoin. If approved, the bill will be the first comprehensive guidance on the supervision and enforcement of stablecoin markets in the United States. The bill also proposes a two-year moratorium for collateralized stablecoins from the date of enactment. If approved by the committee and passed by the so moratorium for collateral. <laughs> wow. Plus, we know now that the banks are zero reserve, right? So if approved by the committee and passed by the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate, the bill would become the first example of crypto legislation in the United States. The latest version also grants some additional authority, authority to the federal regulator compared to the previous versions version. These powers include the power to intervene against state-regulated issuers in case of emergency. States would also be entitled to pass their supervision duties to the federal watchdog if necessary. The previous versions of the draft bill issued on April 24th focus on stablecoin payments rather than overseeing other aspects of digital asset markets such as custodial service providers and algorithmic stablecoins. The bill's latest version is more concise and grants specific powers to state legislators, legislatures as well. So.
And of course, since you guys were saying yesterday, I should chill my stuff a little more. I'm gonna chill. Uh, This is the reason that uh, I talk so much about stable coins. It was like back in 2019 and 2020 it was like working with Alice a on this uh, on this book. So I'm very grateful for her opportunity or the opportunity that she gave me, you know, because 2019 I was just not focused on on the right things. I was all over the place and she hooked me up, like you say. <laughs> so. Um, And one of the cool things, like she allowed me to uh, pick this coin right here. It's like an 1895 coin from Puerto Rico. It's like the only coin that doesn't connect us to like Spain or the U.S. And I'm like, I'm really grateful that she let me like pick that because I'm a nerd for stuff like that. <laughs> but um, but yeah, that was most of the stuff that we were working since back then. Just learning a lot from this and then noticing that this was what was coming you know they were not trying to um release a cbdc through the fed they're trying to release a stable coin payment system through the commercial banks let's see what you guys were talking about banks are great more than 1.5, 1.45 trillion commercial real estate. More. Oh, we talked about this. Yeah, now this is, yeah, this is going to happen. Go check California right now. Sparky, familia. Shout out to Sparky. Shout out to Bernard. Respected by <laughs> Bernard. Don't be mean. Respected by Trump in that specific second where he said it. Trump's body language says it all. He knows he needs to act, but is conscious of getting played. Yeah, no, it was it was a weird situation at that point, obviously, you know. So so what do you think RH will stream Christmas? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe when Hex hits a dollar and we goes and we, we're gonna he's gonna light the candles again at a a dollar hex. If I, if I had to guess, you know, when we hit a dollar. I think it'll be best if we ish, um, assume RH is no longer in the loop and work from there. Waiting on him, in my opinion, is not productive at all. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. It's, I, I just joke around, but I just maybe, I don't know, maybe he had someone else running his, his Twitter. Fatty. Hey, guys. Sparky with the shout out. So, yeah, guys, I'm going to... I'm gonna leave it at that. I uh, I just I wanted to talk about uh, the stablecoin economy uh, and how I'm seeing it happen. Right, like it looks like they're setting it up, and right now the only thing that they're missing is that bill. They're gonna pass it because Maxine Waters already like she was rushing. Uh, right um, here, let's let's look it up real quick. Let's so have the video. Uh, Maybe not. I think I closed it. Oh, it's right here. There we go. Um, let's 
see here. Um, it's called uh, one. Hey, let's just try to look it up. Actually, you know what? I think, Joe, it was that video that uh, uh, Powell talked in. Uh, Not just for Congress, but for supervisory. Oh, here we go. Introduced 11 bills. Now picking a bite over a tiny, tiny fee of less than 1% of total housing costs. Ignoring the costs home buyers are paying with 7% interest rates, appraisal fees, and title insurance. Instead, they're fighting about gas stoves. In fact, just a week ago, Republican disagreed. Not that it that's is. so bad. Jeez, like... on financial institutions, monetary policy for. A while. she talks about. You know what? Maybe it's not this one then. Day to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. No, maybe it's not this one. Maybe it's the other one that she talks. That it wasn't with Powell. Maybe it's the one that they talked to Prometheus, Joe. Then normally I can find all those videos and sometimes Oh here it is. There we go. Monday.com makes gans There was one that was like four hours long or something like that. must abide by strict rules about what it can and cannot do. This is a result of regulation designed to protect investor assets by providing the markets with material information, eliminating conflicts of interest and risk to our financial system, and promoting fair competition. In your view, are crypto exchanges meaningfully different from traditional exchanges such that they should warrant an entirely new legislative and regulatory framework. What would be the effect of crafting a new and separate legal framework for crypto exchanges? Thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, I think it's a general principle that like functions should be regulated in like fashion. And Yeah, we're not going to hear these guys just telling them how they need to be all regulated yeah. thanks no thanks maybe it's this when she this says this waters ranking member of the full committee on financial services there we go here it is thank you very much 
Last Congress, I focused the efforts of this committee around addressing problems in the crypto markets. After the Biden administration testified before our committee about possible bank-like runs of stable coins, I set about working on a comprehensive there we go. set of legislation jointly with Mr. McHenry, the Treasury, and the Federal Reserve. We made solid progress, but didn't quite get there. Treasury and our financial regulators also identified further gaps in oversight in the crypto markets and such as limits in the SEC's authority to go after friends, frauds like FTX, even when they operate just off the coast of Florida. These should be bipartisan concerns and legislation to address them should have a path to the president's desk. I hope this Congress, we can quickly return to developing legislation together. I yield back. I thank the distinguished ranking member. We welcome the testimony today of Mr. Ant Andrew Dorji, Mr. Dorji. Yeah, I couldn't find that other one, but at least we got the one from um, Maxine Waters talking about it. Because yeah, they they talk about how they've been discussing stablecoin legislation. So it's it's kind of odd that as as one you know one part of the part of the politicians are passing laws against CBDCs, another one is passing laws that is going to authorize the banks to be a zero reserve requirement, custody and crypto, and <laughs> Gonna be, they're gonna be regulated by the Fed. So it's like the the so, some of the banks are the ones that own the Fed. If if we see it that way, so it's almost like the Fed is gonna be the one regulating its owners. <laughs> it's fucking classic. Bully next week and bring the spice. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll let him know. Let's see if we can get him on. Fuego. $300 starting price for all-star game. Dang, sorry, off topic. Who do you think will win the home run derby? I picked Soto last year, and I know we'll pick Vladdy Guerrero. Um, I don't, I don't know who's participating. Um, I would, um, if if the Mets guy is going, uh, I would probably pick him, uh, Pete, Petey, Pete Alonso. But I'm not sure if he's gonna be in that in that one, Bernard. But yeah, since you put me in the spot and I can't think, uh, if I were to pick someone from the national, I would pick Petey Alonso. And if I were to pick someone from the American League, I would probably pick uh, Aaron Judge. Actually, I'm gonna pick Shohei Otani. You know what? Let's do that, Bernard. Uh, maybe, but maybe Shohei won't. Uh, he won't participate in the home run derby. So let's say if he participates, then I'll say Shohei wins. If he doesn't participate, then I'll say Pete Alonso. And Aaron Judge will be second. But yeah, guys, I'm going to leave it at that. I hope you're having an amazing Sunday. I'm having a really good Sunday. Hanging out with my kiddo. So I'm going to go I'm gonna watch a movie or something. And hope you guys are doing the same. Hope you guys are enjoying outside of Twitter, outside of Telegram, outside of YouTube and the FUD and all this stuff. Because it's just everything's temporary.
we're we're down right now. But oh, Joe says Judge is injured. Okay, so I'm gonna change. I'm gonna just leave it like that. Then it's gonna be either Otani if he plays, and then if he doesn't, then it'll be Petey Alonso. And if it's not Petey, then I'll I, I don't know. I'll probably like I'll pick whoever is like. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll pick on the day that I see the roster. But I, I I don't even know where the game is. I think the game was in Seattle or something. Uh, Safeco Field. Well, they used to call it Safeco. Now it's called something else. I, I forgot what it's called. We should do that, guys. We should have like a should have like a baseball chat with. Uh, we could have B Flow. We could have some other guys on, and I know a little bit about baseball. Baseball histories. You guys want to talk about like 1940s baseball, 1930s. You guys want to talk about like 1919 Black Sox scandal. I went through all of it. I checked all the all the news articles. I know about the gambling, how much they got paid to throw the World Series. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, they suspended the eight players. She was Joe Jackson. Um uh, he was going to get traded to uh, to the Red Sox. So wouldn't that have been great? Imagine if, like, Shoeless Joe Jackson would have been traded from the White Sox to the Red Sox in 1917. And then, like, he either gets to play with Babe Ruth, right? And then maybe the Red Sox never, never uh, sell Babe Ruth to the Yankees. I mean, it, it's all kinds of shit that could have happened. Imagine the Red Sox with Shoeless Joe Jackson and Babe Ruth. Whew. No curse of the Bambino there. But yeah, guys, I'm going to leave you with that. Like I always say, catch us on the next one, and we'll see you on the block. problem so it's always about circulation and not strictly money money stock but what is it that's supposed to be in circulation well it's not bank reserves bank reserves can't circulate in the real economy because they're only an interbank token so what central banks hope happens is that by giving uh, commercial banks this interbank token they'll then do something in the real economy as a response to it which means circulating either some form of money or credit inside the banking system or more uh more more uh what we would like to see is banks circulate credit in the real economy, to create and circulate credit in the real economy.